their infrastructures are not there. That is first thing which I would like to really appreciate the initiative what you have taken. The second thing I would like to say that here in this audience, in fact, our colleagues from the Directorate Health Services, they are also present. So what it indicates, there is a complete connect, what we study, what research we look at, what our students are doing in the medical institution, and there is a complete connect with the field. So my the second highlighting point, which I feel that you are already into it, you may not be uh, you know, perceiving this, but when we are looking at from the macro level, in fact, we realize that what is the game changer in the system. And therefore, the what we could do in the you know, last few years, and also more so in the light of the pandemic, is that complete connect of the pit cell with our district surveillance unit and also at the state level, the complete connect with our state level surveillance unit, which is something very good. And therefore I always say that it is not that there is a department of medical education or there is a department of directorate of health services or there is a, a food commissioner or there is a, a you know drug controller. We, we, we do as a Kerala health under that umbrella, in fact, everybody is working. So that is something uh, very laudable. And my earnest request to all the pit cell coordinators and the members of the respective pit cell within the, the government setup and also if the private setup, in fact, pit cells are involved, to them also have that connect with the field because then only, in fact, whatever work we do will become more meaningful and productive to get very many results. And that is what we should see at the genome study initiative. That with this connect, we are going forward, which is a, a really a very strong uh, partnership, or I would say that we have merged and we are formulating one very strong surveillance unit uh, within the state. Now we are having some very good futuristic plan. Some of you are involved in that planning and uh, the, we have already you know, given that uh, the, uh, proposal. So as we are going forward, uh, we will look at strengthening our district surveillance unit as well as a feed cell uh, to uh, you know, take it at the next level. So very good amount as a financing that is under plan and hopefully in fact it will, uh, you know, uh, we will succeed. But is, this is at a preliminary stage and it is appropriate that our honorable minister should be declaring about it. But I am just acquainting with you that even at a policy level, this whole importance has been highlighted. Now I will a little bit go back, you know, regarding this COVID and I distinctly remember, I think on the 9th May uh, 2019, there was a major meeting which has been uh, taken and chaired by our honorable health minister. And in that meeting, in fact, uh, more than 70 people, including from the private uh, medical colleges, they participated. And uh, the, in that meeting, there were many uh, good suggestions, uh, the decisions we have taken. Then there is one resource group uh, which formed, and we were all working on through that resource group to have uh, SOPs in place to, to go for a, a, you know, on a Israel model, a mock drill related to how to handle epidemic and all. And as we were progressing, uh, uh, it so happened that we landed up in pandemic in the month of January, 2020. So why I'm narrating this, that definitely in fact, we have to think always ahead and we have to do a lot of planning and we have to do capacity building. And that is why when the new disease popped up, in fact, there was not a gap of uh, any a single day because from that day onwards, uh, there was a whole lot of effort which has happened at all the level, uh, right from the DHS, DME, uh, the, the, the NHM, everywhere through our system. And within shortest possible time, in fact, we could uh, build the management structure in all the district, which is phenomenal. Now I would like to pose that question to you. How did it happen? And uh, uh, you know how we could you know, uh, kept on improving qualitatively. That is because of, uh, these are some of the foundation which are there and we are further progressing. So the good sign is 
we are not in a static phase, but we keep on building what we have been doing. And I would look forward to everybody's uh, enthusiastic, uh, coordinated uh, approach towards the next few things. Very briefly, in fact, Dr. Vinod, there has been of immense help. The quality code model has given us an input which variant or uh, which uh, the, the, the uh, you know, virus of uh, what origin might have come and spread it. So there was one from Karnataka, there was one from Maharashtra, and there was one from all the way from Orissa. So it was very obvious with the amount of you know, uh, migration, etc., those uh, set of things, uh, you know, because of that, the disease uh, got spreaded in during that span of time. Based on that study, in fact, we have taken a decision well in time in the month of November, when the total country was not even talking about the genome study at India level, that our Honorable Chief Minister and Health Minister had given us a guidance to roll out in all the 14 districts. And since then, Dr. Vinod has been coordinating with all of us to uh, take it forward. Now we have reached that Northern Kerala, in fact, the first set of samples also got tested. And very soon, I think uh, the Southern part also will join this. So uh, that is what we are trying to do. Now, there are two things which I would like to mention. The whole country, in fact, some of the section uh, is asking or you know, mentioning the number of cases in Kerala are uh, on the rise and the epidemic is uh, very, very high and they look at the point prevalence. Nobody is doing in-depth study and not mentioning that the amount of surge which has happened in other states, this state has never reached to that kind of a peaks. The amount of number of infection which has happened in the first few months itself, this state was, uh, you know, throughout the year, it is taking time to reach to that level. So what, uh, what has actually happened? That we were shifting the surge and we will consistently, in fact, with the public action and everybody's support, we were flattening that curve. So that is what is happening. And our infection is moving at a very uh, particular level of, uh, you know, the band. So what it indicates, if there is a, a huge outbreak, and in fact, uh, Dr. Vinod will also speak when he will be talking about genome studies and nuances, but it's interpretation. If at all there was a huge kind of infection, then geometric progression, we would have over a period of time, we would have uh, 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 reached to a very many cases per day. If that is not happening, that means somewhere we are able to detect and then break the chain. However, we should also be you know, ensuring that this number also comes down. Therefore, there is a constant effort and qualitative improvement which is required. Now you people are basically in fact having a vast knowledge. What I would like uh, from you is that during your informal discussions or formal discussion, you will have to give this technical input in all the forum and also people at large so that there will be a better understanding about the epidemic. Second part is genome study is going to tell us uh, the many other things. Parallelly, in fact, with everybody's involvement, we are doing zero surveillance study. So these two studies are going to say, zero surveillance study will tell us the prevalence and the percentage of population which is not as infected will demonstrate how our field work was happening in those particular districts. And therefore, our zero surveillance is only giving these many figures. That study design is also very robust. So what we are looking forward to at a macro level these two studies output will, uh, uh, you know, on a scientific rationale, will establish the way epidemic is getting handled and why we should get bogged down with the number. Number in the any pandemic will keep coming, but how we have tackled the patient and what patient care we have provided. And uh, we, after that, uh, how the patients in fact recuperated, that is going to be a hallmark. So now I would like to take you say five year down the line or 10 year down the line. When all of these people will study, they will say that these are the scientific approach which we should apply to ensure that how the disease is progressing and also contain that disease and then mitigate all the adversities which are related to that disease. So these are some of the points 
which we should constantly keep it in mind and uh, you know uh, contribute in whatever way so that that knowledge goes to the field level immediately within your district and within sub district and we qualitatively improve our all programmatic function not only with related to covid now today it is pandemic therefore we are talking about covid but i feel that in context of any kind of a disease burden what we are having if we are having such systematic approach completely ingrained and if we do concretely all these things we will definitely be become one of the hallmark i think i am taking a little bit of time but there are three requests to pit cell there is a one very good initiative we have requested there was a enthusiasm but our quest for excellence is static it has not gone forward there is also in fact whatever forum or whenever i get opportunity our involvement of the students ug student and the pg student has to improve in more than what actually at this point of time i think that it is very very limited we have to do third thing is always any initiative taken which is a state wide each one of us should look at it proactively so our approach should be how it can be done at a faster pace that is what is required with this uh, few words in fact i will definitely look forward to dr vinod's uh, uh, presentation and also uh, his overview in fact i have requested i had a discussion with him that he can also briefly uh, you know give based on his studies the overview regarding epidemic in kerala that will help us and i once again appreciate the initiatives uh, is taken by uh, dme principals of all the medical colleges and especially the pit cell to take certain things forward and we definitely are confident that in future uh, many more things will happen through this excellent structure which is there in our medical college i uh, stop here thank you very much for giving this opportunity to uh, address all of you thank you thank you sir may I now invite dr ritan kelkar uh, the state mission director of nhm nhm is actually funding the uh, the genomic study actually this program which has participants from faculty medical government private medical colleges health service and private sector is is going live from the nhm uh, site as well website as well Dr. Ethan Kilker, over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Indu. At the outset, let me congratulate the Peat Cell for organizing the series. I think it is very pertinent that we should have such kind of uh, update series because generally, in times of uh, uh, need, what we generally do is when we have an issue or a crisis at hand, we look at uh, uh, trying to mitigate it by various operational interventions and firefighting. but we somehow down the line tend to forget that there are various dots which needs to be uh, all uh, lined up properly and we need to draw a line between the dots to give us a bigger picture and i hope that such kind of series will throw open uh, various gaps in the way in which we've been handling uh, public health issues so that we'll have a bigger picture in hand understand the gaps and move forward in the right intervention and probably Uh, in um, the scenario of uh, covid will be a little ahead of the curve and uh, understand the nuances in uh, uh, covid management i would like to read out a quote which i came across from everett coop it says uh, it goes like this healthcare is vital to all of us some of the time but public health is vital to all of us all of the time and uh, in times of covid what has happened we've all seen and known and read Uh, so what uh, has happened is the essential services of public health uh, be it the delivery of uh, rch services the communicable disease uh, mitigation measures or the non communicable disease uh, interventions the mental health interventions the blood services across the globe have uh, been disrupted and uh, we and there is a study from who which was published i think in august 2020 which uh, gives information about how the healthcare delivery has been Uh, devastated because of uh, covid and it is very very pertinent for us uh, especially uh, for an evolved uh, uh, society and uh, evolved healthcare system uh, like kerala uh, to have these kind of um, interventions like the one which we are having in terms of a genetic uh, study or a genome study to understand the nature of the virus 
understand from where it has originated, what is it going to do in the future, and how best we can mitigate and control the spread of this so that the healthcare service, which is supposed to be delivered effectively, is delivered effectively, and we ensure that all the uh, problems or uh, mitigation measures which we can take as part of COVID management can be taken. I think in this direction, uh, intervention like this, like a series which the Pete's Hill has uh, uh, started, uh, plays a very important and significant role because this is a platform where a lot of great uh, uh, minds come together towards identifying a particular problem and also trying to identify solutions which can be put to practice. So my only request is the studies which are there in the lab I should go to the field. And that is where our uh, requirement from lab to the field should be as fast as possible and should not uh, leave us uh, behind the curve. So we should ensure that our uh, study, whatever is there, should have a specific timeline and uh, should be very relevant to the current, uh, current context so that we'll be able to handle the existing uh, issue at hand much better. And in this context, we are handling COVID. So definitely the genome study uh, should uh, throw out uh, results which we can uh, probably uh, use very effectively to control and manage the COVID-19 in a, a probably a better fashion than what we've been doing earlier. So with those words, um, I thank all of you uh, and uh, also wish this update series the very best. I understand that a lot of uh, uh, I know series uh, still planned on various topics and I hope that uh, it will all be enlightening for all of us and we'll all get to learn something and also ensure that the public health uh, service delivery is as effective as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. May I now invite our Director of Medical Education, Ramla Bibi Madam, for her presidential address. Thank you. Mute turn, Madam. Uh, respected uh, Rajan sir, uh, Retan sir, uh, Sarita madam, I mean actually and all other my colleagues and dear friends. First of all, I congratulate the entire team of state bids that is headed by uh, Dr. Indu for excellently conducting and organizing this program. Actually, the bid cells uh, uh, have started functioning the, from the day back when the large output of uh, chicken video uh, started in the district of Halepi. So actually, I still remember the activities that I have taken. Uh, at that time, our Joint Director of Medical Education, Dr. Thomas Matthew, was, the, was heading the PID cell and he was uh, working behind that. And also the Dr. Sarah Burgess also was also uh, head, head of the PID cell uh, uh, for a long time. And now the Hindu is, Hindu is heading that. And uh, when the outbreaks uh, comes out in the community or in, the, in our state, what has happened is, the PID cells initiate the activities and after that what will happen is all the medical colleges, government medical colleges have started uh, the regional PID cells under the head of the Department of Community Medicine with all clinicians and experts in the team. So they will sit together and evaluate the conditions and they will uh, not, their, their works will, they are not limited inside the campuses of medical colleges, they will come go out in the periphery and in the community and identify the cause of the outbreaks and identify the uh, hotspots, etc. And uh, they are actively participating in the active containments of the epidemics as well. So for the last one year, the activities of PID cells of all medical colleges are linked with the activities of mm -hmm. services and also peripheral community. So uh, another important uh, thing that I have observed is there is an active involvement of the students also in the PID cells in various activities. So now, uh, the PID cell of the PID cells of medical colleges and uh, the, the state PID cell came out with a series of uh, webinars uh, for uh, uh, passing information to everybody, what is happening in the society and also what are the new, what are the new things that is coming out. So that is, uh, this is the one of the uh, first, is, first in this series. The topic that has been selected is uh, relevant to this uh, uh, time. And the Dr. Vinod's career has uh, kind of, uh, thankfully uh, extended her support in all the activities and also he is giving a very good talk in this. And uh, we had uh, initiated a genomic survey and the details will be explained to you later. Initially, it, it is under the uh, guidance of uh, Dr. Chandiri. It has started in Koriko district and it has, the research have been came out as everybody knows. And it will be, we have started it. Sir, uh, the ethical clearance has been got from the 
uh, all medical colleges, sir, uh, that is for the information of our uh, respective health secretary. So in this connection, I would uh, thank everybody for uh, attending this, for making the work. Uh, they have identified their time to attend this uh, seminar and wish you all the very best and I wish all the very best for the facial teams also in all medical colleges. Thank you. Um, thank you, madam. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Sarita Madam is, has joined. Uh, may now invite Dr. Sarita Arnold, Director of Health Service, for her special address. Uh, Hello, Sar Sarita Madam is not there. She's traveling, I think, uh, to. Meena, she's very good. Meena, Respected Rajan Sir, Ratan Sir, Ramla Madam, uh, Sarah Madam, and all other uh, dignities from uh, medical education and also from health services. Uh, we uh, In Kerala, we have a strong network of uh, surveillance system that is IDSP and uh, PITSEL is part of IDSP. Uh, the faculties, the experts from medical college are part of the state RRT team and also the district RRT team. And in, in the uh, context of outbreaks and all, outbreak investigation, uh, we used to get the uh, active support of uh, medical colleges, uh, not only government, uh, from private also in some districts. And uh, they are supporting us uh, uh, in all outbreaks, not only outbreaks, all the uh, disease control activities, the support we used to get from medical colleges. So uh, I thank uh, I know uh, when I was doing my PG, Sarah uh, Madam was the uh, PITSEL coordinator, state court, PITSEL coordinator. And now Dr. Indu is heading the uh, state PITSEL. She's always uh, supportive and cooperative also. So uh, regarding the study, uh, genomic sequencing study, uh, Dr. Vinod, uh, it's it's a prestigious uh, study, as uh, Sir said. Uh, we have two studies: the genomic sequencing study and also the zero surveillance study. Both are uh, important to us. And um, thank you, thank you, Dr. Meenakshi. Uh, with that, shall we move to the uh, talk of the day may I now invite Dr. Vinod Skare. He is an alumnus from uh, Calicut Medical College. Uh, he's a principal scientist at the CSIR IGIB. And uh, there are many dignitaries in the group, including the uh, Vice Chancellor of Kerala Health University, Dr. Mohan Gunmal. Uh, I think uh, after Vinod's talk, we will have a very um, uh, distinct discussion on the public health consequences of gen genomic variations, genetic variations in COVID-19. Over to you, Dr. Vinod. Thank you, Dr. Indu, for the introduction and a very warm welcome to the talk. Um, before I um, start my talk, let me also introduce uh, where I come from. I come from the CSI Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology. It is one of the... I think I lost my connection. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you're yeah. right. So I come from the CSI Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology. So this is one of the 39 national laboratories under the CSI system. Uh, and we work in the area of genomics and one of the pertin pertinent aspects that we work is in the area of clinical genomics. Today we are one of the institutes probably globally having the largest clinical networks working in a variety of aspects, right from education, public health and epidemiology, research and development, uh, building and also deploying genetic diagnostics and of course with industrial partnerships. Um, 
But today's talk is essentially about genomics of SARS-CoV-2. And I'll touch upon two big paradigms that have actually happened thanks to the COVID uh, pandemic. The first paradigm has been that genomics has actually become the center stage. And this is probably the first time in the history of mankind that genomics or what we call as high throughput genomics has actually met virology. Virology traditionally has been a, a field which, which involved isolation of the virus, culture of the virus, and in many ways observing the virus probably under an electron microscopy or uh, very recently through molecular methods. But it has never been a, a, a field of, uh, of microbiology where you could actually identify microbes for that matter, even bacteria, viruses, or parasites using genome sequencing. And this has been largely possible because today we can generate billions of base pairs of genome sequence in less than 24 hours at a quite affordable cost. Now, what really goes into such a, a enormous paradigm shift is not just the throughput of sequencing, but also the ability of, uh, uh, of mankind to be able to analyze the sequences and put them back into the context of what pathogen it is and what is the host interactions that happen with it. Now, this could be exemplified right here that unlike the previous epidemics uh, in India or across the world, genomes of the pathogen didn't take months. In many, many cases, it actually took years. For example, the Nipah virus uh, epidemic in Kerala took years before the, the genomes became publicly available. In this particular case, you would see the genome is actually available in public domain in weeks. And actually the publication, which after peer review has appeared in February, 2020, uh, uh, a few months after the initial outbreak in Wuhan. And what we know all about the virus is thanks to this initial genome sequence, what we call as Wuhan human one, uh, which encompasses around 30,000 base pairs and which is very similar to other coronaviruses of the pan family. Now, if you really go back to the materials and methods of this paper, uh, you, you could sort of recapitulate what is sort of exemplified a few slides earlier. In this particular experiment, what they did is to take the, the patient sample, which is bronchial lavage, did a total extraction, and of course, directly went into RNA sequencing. They didn't, they didn't enrich the virus, nor did they culture the virus, nor did they observe the virus under an electron microscope. So that's really a paradigm shift. And from the sample to RNA sequencing today in any standard laboratory across the world is less than 24 hours. So in other words, this is essentially a new technology that can allow you to arrive from sample to sequence to identification of the pathogen in days, if not weeks. And of course, what followed RNA sequencing was an elaborate set of computational analysis, which could essentially identify the virus not just identify the virus, but also put the virus in the context of other known organism genomes, which are available in public domain. So that's paradigm number one. I'll come to paradigm number two, but before I do that, uh, what I need to also exemplify, and this I'll come again and again in my talk, is the fact that all organisms accumulate genetic mutations, whether it is humans, whether it is viruses, or whether it's bacteria, we all evolve by accumulating mutations. Now, the only difference between humans and viruses is the rate of accumulating mutations. And of course, viruses do have a much higher rate of genetic mutations. And for SARS-CoV-2, we estimate that approximately one mutation every seven to 10 days. So this has two implications. One, if you prolong the pan pandemic, you would have viruses which evolve more and more stealthily. Second, you could look at these genetic mutations and also do what we call as chromosomal fingerprinting or genomic fingerprinting, which essentially means that you can trace the origin and spread of the virus just by looking at the sequences of the viruses because the mutation rates are pretty much constant. You could sort of exemplify this in, in this observation. Uh, for example, the Wuhan Q1 was, uh, was isolated from patient on December 26th. By Jan 8th, there's another genome that was publicly available, the, which is called Wuhan Q9, uh, it has accumulated a mutation. Uh, and of course, as time progresses, it started accumulating more and more mutations. So this is something that you need to keep in mind that the virus keeps accumulating genetic mutations and these genetic mutations are essentially a factor of time. Uh, and of course, this can have 
a variety of implications which I will discuss in the future slides. The second big paradigm has been that people have openly shared this data with everyone across the world. Now, this has never happened in the history of mankind, and it has never happened that 350,000 genomes of SARS-CoV-2, which has been sequenced across the world, has been now available in public domain. And for, for that matter, no organism ever in the history of mankind has been sequenced 350,000 times by different people. Now, thanks to resources uh, maintained by the NIH uh, and, of course, the GISAID, uh, which, which was originally created to share influenza genome data, uh, we today have access to all these genome sequences. And this is essentially a valuable resource for not just students, but also researchers and clinicians to not just track the outbreaks, but also to understand how does a virus evolve and how does a virus mutate and how does it spread across different parts of the world. And one thing remarkable is that this has also come from very large programs across the world, including the COG UK Consortium, which uh, today encompasses almost, I would say, uh, almost 50% of the 350,000 genomes. So that's the throughput of sequencing that is happening elsewhere in the world. And no doubt that you identify new genetic variants and new mutations as, as they spread across the world. Now, the other thing that you need to keep in mind that I also sort of stated before is that the virus accumulates mutations. And this accumulation of mutations occur at random positions and at a constant rate, or in other words, if you take time points, which, uh, which are exemplified by the, the vertical lines out here, if the virus mutates at a constant rate and spreads at a constant rate, then the proportions of each of these mutations or each of these variants would typically be the same. But that is not really what we see in real life uh, or real world situations. And that is because at some points in time, there are points of what we call as emergence and emergence could be because of host factors like for example a super spreading event or could be because of a viral factor because there's a genetic mutation which makes it more infectious or more fit to spread across the human population in such situations you would have the proportion of a set of genetic variations which would be disproportionately large in the pool of sequences at that point in time and these are essentially very useful ways to assess the host as well as the viral factors in terms of looking at emergency events. Now, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that practically all the SARS-CoV-2 genomes are pretty much alike, except for a few genetic mutations. And these few genetic mutations can be today a dozen to two to three dozen genetic variants which are different from each other or different from the, uh, the original WHO1 genome sequence. So therefore, each of these genetic variants are essentially genetic lineages or genetic clades and not essentially strains of the virus. So strains of the virus would necessarily mean that SARS-CoV-2 is a strain of the virus, which is distinctly different from SARS-CoV-1 or the MERS-CoV or, or the MERS coronavirus. But essentially when we talk about genetic lineages, we are, we are talking about the UK variant or the UK genetic lineage or the South African genetic lineage. These are all genetic lineages of the same strain of the virus, which is SARS-CoV-2. So we should not really call them as strains, but you should call them as genetic lineages or genetic clades. Now, of course, this global data, which is accumulated from across the world could be put together into a phylogenetic tree. Uh, on the x-axis, what you see is the timeline, different months of last year. And the y-axis, what you see is the divergence, which is essentially how different are these strains from each other, or these lineages from each other. And as I said before, the, the variants or the genetic lineages are not equally proportional to each other, but there's some genetic lineages which are disproportionately large from each other. And as you see here, there's a large blue blob in the top, which is essentially a a clade or a genetic lineage, what we call as the A2A clade. And to keep in mind that during early origins of the pandemic, that means early in January and February, these genetic lineages roughly translated to the origins of the virus as they moved across different continents. If 
For example, the B superclade, which includes the B1, B2, and B4, are essentially viruses which came out of China. Uh, and the A2A, uh, the blue one that you see on the top, are essentially the genetic lineages which came out of Europe. So in early in the pandemic, for example, if you were to, if you were to do a genetic sequencing in January or February uh, uh, last year, uh, and if you get an A2A, you could immediately identify the source of the infection or introduction as an individual who would have probably traveled out of UK. But over time, what happens is that these genetic lineages spread far and wide, and depending upon the relative advantage that they have with each other, and also depending upon the pool uh, of introductions, they could be of different proportions as they move across the world. Now, to give a brief history, uh, I, I'm sure you don't really require this brief history because you're almost a year from identification of the first SARS-CoV-2 patient uh, uh, right there in Kerala. And over the last year, we have now close to uh, over uh, uh, 97 lakh individuals who have been confirmed with SARS-CoV-2 and many, probably many more who have never been tested for SARS-CoV-2. Now, India has not been far behind in terms of genome sequencing. And today we have uh, over 6,300 6, odd SARS-CoV-2 genomes available in public domain and many more genome sequences which are still not yet available in public domain. But thanks to the effort of a large number of researchers who worked very hard even during limited resources and limited time schedules which is imposed by the lockdown periods, but nevertheless has contributed to a very unique resource of SARS-CoV-2 genomes, which are now available in public domain. And for individuals who are really interested in following up the genetic variants and the frequencies across different states, there's this fantastic resource that we have sort of put together, which is called Indico, which indexes practically all genomes of SARS-CoV-2, which are available in public domain, and many more, which are also not yet available in public domain. Now, when we talk about sequencing of SARS-CoV-2, what we also need to keep in mind is that while well, sequencing used to be a quite laborious and time-consuming, and of course, costly expedition, what SARS-CoV-2 has teached us was you could actually make cheaper alternatives, which are scalable as well as cost-effective. And the Megalab concept of CSR was essentially one of the, the first concepts in this particular area in India. And the idea of the Megalab concept was to use high throughput sequences that we otherwise use to sequence human genomes to be able to detect SARS-CoV-2 at scale, at a cost which is comparable to RT-PCR and providing more information than a typical RT-PCR would provide. So in other words, you could do genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 for detection of SARS-CoV-2, therefore making it comparable to RT-PCR in the cost, but probably more sensitive and specific than a typical RT-PCR. And this was put together, um, this concept was put together by my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Sridhar Srivasubhu, and a fantastic set of young researchers in my lab, uh, and of course, Dr. Sridhar's lab. And uh, the, this test was also, uh, I mean, taken from Illumina, which is called the COVID-seq, and tested in clinical samples, probably for the first time in the world. Uh, of course, this slide is a bit complicated, but uh, to, to sort of state that this is sort of a uh, well thought about uh, system where you could essentially multiplex multiple samples, uh, pull them using barcodes, sequence them, and of course, build quite elaborate analysis tools uh, for detection of SARS-CoV-2, as well as for analysis and interpretation of SARS-CoV-2 with respect to a variety of other aspects. The other thing that is uh, <clears throat> unique to the system is that it is quite scalable and the scale <clears throat> could be as small as 96 samples, <clears throat> as high as 3000 samples. <clears throat> and the idea is that all of this could happen in approximately around 24 to 48 hours time period. <clears throat> In other words, you could have a much modular and a much scalable system ranging, depending upon the needs that you have from 96 samples to 3000 samples in a couple of days. We really piloted out uh, in the early part of the pandemic in different states, 
mostly the western part of UP, uh, Orissa, uh, Karnataka, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and of course Kerala. And we did a quite an interesting set of genetic epidemiology analysis. Some of these publications are available in public domain. I'll not delve too deep into it. But in summary, what we found is that out of the 10 odd clades or genetic lineages that were found across the world, um, India did have around six of those clades. And apart from the six, we had an additional genetic clade or genetic lineage, uh, which is marked here in, in purple. And this clade we named as I or the A3I, I to signify that this was a clade or a lineage, which is predominantly found in India and A3I to signify that it shared some genetic lineage or some genetic mutations with the A3 clade of uh, SARS-CoV-2. The A3 clade of SARS-CoV-2 here in green uh, are essentially the viruses which came out of Iran. Now, of course, this was a distinctly large number in India and such numbers were never found uh, uh, at any point in time anywhere in the world. And we did characterize the mutational spectrum of this uh, genetic lineage. Uh, and this genetic lineage has uh, five genetic mutations which mark it. One of it, this genetic mutation was essentially also shared with the A3 clade, uh, therefore the name A3i. Now I sort of said before that the SARS-CoV-2, uh, the genetic mutations occur at a very constant rate. So one of the interesting things that we sort of could answer at that point in time was does different clades of the virus have different mutation rates? And uh, to be frank, they don't have distinctly different genetic mutation rates, except for this unique clade, which is called IA3I, which has significantly smaller mutation rate or substitution rate compared to the most prevalent or the A2A clade of the virus. So in other words, this genetic lineage had probably less fitness because it could mutate much slower and then therefore we sort of predicted at some point of time this genetic lineage would be overpowered or would be eliminated by the other competing lineages of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we also went back to the data and sort of looked at what are the prevalence uh, of these genetic lineages across different states and different states indeed had different prevalence of this particular genetic lineage. Uh, you, could, you could see uh, it, it as a major lineage in, for example, states like Delhi or Andhra Pradesh or, for example, Karnataka. But this could be a very minor lineage or in, in some cases like Kerala, this lineage didn't even exist. And since you could trace the genetic lineage in terms of the mutations and in terms of time, you could also identify that this clade emerged out of a single superspreading event, clustered in time and space, and then spread across the different parts of the country, therefore creating the, uh, the lineage which spread across uh, different parts of the country. And as expected, this genetic lineage was, uh, was depleted over time. Uh, as you see here, the purple, uh, the purple uh, color out there has sort of diminished over the, over the late last year and ceased to exist today in any part of the country. And this was largely been replaced by the blue uh, sort of uh, shape out there, which sort of signifies the A2A lineage, uh, which came out of Europe. So in other words, today A2A lineage uh, comprises of almost 99% of all SARS-CoV-2 isolates, which are found in the country. Now, since you could also look at the genomes and the genetic variations, it's clustered in space and time, you could also understand how the virus is spread across different parts of the country. And this is what we call as molecular contact tracing, because looking at the genome of an organi organism, given a background of a lot of other genomes, which has, which has been sequenced from populations, you could now assign how did the lineage emerge and spread from one position to a different position or a different location in the country. And as you see here, different human factors, like for example, the lockdowns uh, and, and of course migrations, which followed the lockdowns. And of course, uh, uh, later in the epidemic, flights and travel across different states has contributed to the virus spreading from one state to another uh, across different points in time. 
<clears throat> in other words, if you look at the distribution of virus in, in across the country, what you really see is that a few large local outbreaks contributed to the majority of the spread uh, within the country. And, and many of these large outbreaks uh, are, are really known in literature uh, as in uh, quite well discussed in news and media. And as we also see from the genomic data that this large outbreaks, many of them could also be from neighboring states has contributed to a significantly large number of cases rising and spreading, not just in the state, but across state boundaries. And as I said, Kerala was part of this initial surveillance. Uh, we did this pilot from a few samples from Northern Kerala, mostly from the Calicut Medical College. Uh, Dr. Chandni, who was my teacher, was also the leader for this program. And what we found from Kerala was quite remarkable. The first thing that we found, as expected, was that we had a monophyletic distribution. And this monophyletic distribution encompasses completely of the A2A clade. And the A2A clade is also marked by a genetic variant, which is called D614G, quite discussed in literature. D614G allows the virus to latch quite effectively to the receptor and or otherwise has been suggested to have an increased infectivity. The other interesting fact that we observed is that uh, unlike the observations or unlike the beliefs that people had that international travelers had contributed to the largest outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2 in Kerala, we didn't find any clusters of international travelers or international samples contributing to the outbreaks. But what we really found was three large clusters for convenience, let's name it as K1, K2, and K3, and three large clusters which didn't have an international introduction, but an introduction from a local origin, mostly from the nearby states or from migrant travelers had contributed to the outbreaks in Kerala. Now, I, I, I will uh, recluse from stating that this is a picture across Kerala, but at least Calicut and adjoining districts for which Calicut Medical College has been a major testing center. And apart from that, uh, of course, we did find genetic mutations, which, uh, uh, which could affect the primary and probe sensitivity. I will discuss that a, a, a few slides later. And of course, Kerala was probably one of the first states to acknowledge that these findings are really important. Now just acknowledge these findings and the chief minister went on record stating the study and the implications of the study and not that to also extend the study to encompass all 14 districts of the state, which today we are, we, uh, which today is a program which is ongoing. And today this program, which uh, is a massive scale program, probably, uh, I mean, uh, as, as uh, people in Kerala should be really proud of, nowhere else in any state of the country has been such a large program which involves coordination of multiple organizations multiple agencies and departments have ever happened before and this program today encompasses the 12 government medical colleges the state public health and the regional public health laboratories the inter-university center for biomedical research uh, which is under the university system the center university of kerala which is in Kasagod, the Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, which is a DPT institutions and involving the district surveillance units of all districts uh, and under the leadership of Dr. Meenakshi. And this is funded by the NHM Kerala. And uh, you could find more information about this program on the website uh, out here. Now, of course, it's not a question anymore that whether you can do genome sequences. That was of course a question early in January. But today the question is, can we use this genome sequences to understand very pertinent factors or facts that the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic could provide us? And what is the most important thing is, of course, can we evaluate and build better diagnostics? And, and more recently, as we move to giving vaccines, uh, it is all about understanding immune epitopes and how can we design better vaccines? And of course, in, in a public health perspective, the other idea is to also look at functional effects of genetic variations, functional in terms of increasing or decreasing infectivity or, or spread of the virus. Now, I'll tell one point in this, and that is regarding the diagnostics. 
And as you all know, RT-PCR has become a mainstay of diagnostics for the SARS-CoV-2. And RT-PCR, like all other PCR or polymerase chain reactions, essentially encompass a step which includes a primer or probe which binds to the nucleic acid sequence. So essentially the step involves amplification or recognition of a, of a particular region in the genome. And this recognition is mediated by complementarity of the primer or probe to the genome sequence of the virus. Now, many of these primers and probes, unfortunately, were created at a point in time when there was no sequence or based on the initial sequence of SARS-CoV-2. And over time, many of these sequences have actually accumulated a lot of genetic mutations, which could now hamper or interfere with the primers and probe binding to them, and therefore the efficacy of these reactions. So in other words, you could now map genomic variations into these sites if you know the primers and probes, and now evaluate their effect in terms of disrupting or making it less effective. And now you could also address this in terms of the frequencies across uh, the, the global populations. So in very simple, what you see here is uh, a, a essentially a map. Uh, uh, on the x-axis are essentially the positions across the virus genome. The red dots are essentially the, the variants in the primer or probe binding sites. And the y-axis is essentially nothing but the frequency of those genetic variations in the global populations. And what you see here is a significant number of genetic variations, around 123 odd genetic variants, which are mapping to the primer and probe binding sites. And depending upon the genomes that you have in your, in your local context, you can now evaluate the diagnostics even without doing a single experiment, whether those diagnostic reagents are likely to be uh, giving false negative results or they're likely to work very effectively. Now, the other aspect of looking at genomics is to observe and, and explain a few pertinent questions that you find in clinical settings. And of course, uh, uh, this has also been widely discussed in news because these are very peculiar clinical events. One is, of course, persistent infection. And persistent infection necessarily means that an individual consistently tests positive for SARS-CoV-2. An average interval for testing positive to negative is approximately around 5 to 12 days. But there are individuals who continue to become SARS-CoV-2 positive, even on RT-PCR for a quite long time in many ways few weeks to few months the other interesting clinical conundrum is reinfection where an individual who had an infection for SARS-CoV-2 recovered from the infection became RT-PCR negative and after some point of time he contacts another infection for SARS-CoV-2 and becomes RT-PCR positive again and this should also be uh, what you call similar to a very closely related uh, condition, which is called reactivation, where in an individual becomes uh, positive for uh, RT-PCR, then again becomes negative, and after some point of time, typically two to three weeks, becomes positive again for RT-PCR. Therefore, that necessarily means that the virus could probably have reactivated. Now, these three clinical conundrums to understand this, you need to go back to understanding a bit of immunology. And a bit of immunology that you need to understand is that for viruses, there are two types of immune systems that act. The humoral immune response, which is modulated by B cells, which produce antibodies against the virus, mostly against the surface proteins. And in the surface proteins, the most exposed protein becoming the, the S protein or the spike protein. The other aspect of it is a cell-mediated immune response. The cell-mediated immune response could be raised against a number of proteins because this essentially involves the virus getting into the cell, the cell uh, breaking up the virus into small peptides and presenting them using the MHC system to T cells, which recognize them and kill T cells, which are infected with the virus. Okay. Now, to understand such aspects, you need to create a surveillance system. And this is the real value of creating surveillance systems in, and putting things in place even before the events have occurred. Now, this surveillance system was built in collaboration with uh, the, uh, uh, tertiary care hospital in Western UP, the Government Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, and IJB had been very fortunate to have been partnered with this institute. We also helped them set, a, set up their RT-PCR uh, center early in the pandemic. And one of the ideas that we sort of toyed was to put every single healthcare worker on COVID duty in that hospital on an active surveillance system. 
and this active surveillance system included RT-PCR screening of every single individual in, in that cohort uh, right from April 2020. And this was put together by a fantastic collaborator, Dr. Vivek Gupta. And we found a few interesting cases out there. And these interesting cases essentially were reinfections of healthcare or hospital workers who were on COVID duty. And as you see here on the timeline, these individuals became RT-PCR positive. Some of them were hospitalized because at that point in time, the, the criteria necessitated hospitalization for these individuals. They became RT-PCR negative and after some point of time became RT-PCR positive, again, uh, uh, contributing to another round of hospitalization or home quarantine. Now, these individuals could never have been picked up because these were asymptomatic. They never had any symptoms and then therefore never, never seek uh, healthcare and therefore, otherwise, they would never would have been tested for SARS-CoV-2. And that, therefore, creating a surveillance system can pick up unique patients, which otherwise uh, the world cannot see or the world cannot pick up. And for that matter, this is the world's first cases of asymptomatic reinfections in any individual because of SARS-CoV-2. Now, how do you prove that it's a reinfection? The answer is quite simple. What you need to do is to do genome sequencing of the RT-PCR samples from the first and the second episodes. And uh, the E1 and E2 are at the episodes uh, for inter individuals I1 and I2. And what is very clear from here is that the E1 and E2 were caused by viruses which were distinctly different mutations. In other words, this is essentially a case of reinfection because the virus has very different mutations in the first and the second episodes of infection. Another interesting thing that we sort of found, quite a chance observation, that there was a genetic mutation. One of these genetic mutations was N440K, probably one of the first reports of N440K. And N440K is essentially an immune escape mutation. And this was reported uh, to escape a monoclonal antibody called C135. Uh, and, and therefore, we also report a case of an immune escape mutation in a case of reinfection. Now, I said the other case that is of clinical interest is the case of reactivation. And in a similar way, what you have is individuals who test RT-PCR positive, then become RT-PCR negative, And after a fixed amount of time, they become RT-PCR positive again. And if they have the same virus, that necessarily means that the virus was reactivated because if they were reinfected, then they would have a different mutation spectrum. Now, this is another case uh, built out of a surveillance system. And this was from the Medanda Hospital uh, for a child with neuroblastoma on, on chemotherapy, was tested on routine surveillance. Uh, and of course, the chemotherapy was stopped. And after three weeks, uh, the RT-PCR was also negative. After 42 days, the kid became RT-PCR positive the samples for both the infections were sequenced. And what we found was the exact same mutation spectrum for the virus, suggesting that the virus had actually reactivated. We don't really know why a virus would reactivate, but of course, these are clues that you could sort of understand. And the other pertinent thing as of public health importance that you would increasingly be discussing, and of course, increasingly being uh, seen in, in a public health aspect is immune escape variants. Now, by definition, immune escape variants or antibody escape variants are variants in the SARS-CoV-2, mostly in the spike protein, which can invade single or multiple antibodies or panels of convalescent plasma. In other words, this could escape one or many of the antibodies either produced, uh, uh, produced in the lab or produced by humans as evident from convalescent plasma. Now, there are around 120 such genetic variants described in literature and well studied uh, for the property of immune escape. Now, individually, uh, these escape mutations are not of much importance or much relevance, uh, but of course of academic interest, but because of the fact that in a normal infection or because of vaccines, even when, when you give a subunit of the spike protein, there is not one antibody that the body produces, but essentially a polyclonal response which targets multiple domains of the spike protein, uh, which elicits the humoral immune response. Now, what is really alarming is not one mutations that you find, 
but multiple mutations that occur together. Now, how this is important? It's important because if you already have a genetic mutation which could escape immune response, then on that background, you could accumulate more mutations over time and you could in, in some ways predict over time how many mutations could occur. And if multiple mutations could recur on the same background, then it could considerably escape a set of major antibodies and then therefore could be something of alarm. Now globally, we are starting to see this at least in one lineage, which is a 501B2, we see three escape mutations which co-occur on the spike protein. And of course, more mutations that would co-occur on this background would eventually escape the humoral immune system. And this is something that we need to keep in track. And of course, we, did, we do keep in track of genomes across the world and of course, India, across India. And in India, we have 19 such genetic variants. Most of these genetic variants are of very minuscule proportions, so nothing to really worry about. But one of these genetic mutations, N440K, was found in a, a significantly large number, around 30% in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, this is samples from mostly August and September, but now increasing. We know you are mute. Sorry for that. So yeah, so we have been tracking this viruses and genetic variants across the world and across the country. And what we found was 19 genetic mutations, which has a property of immune escape, which is present across the country. One of these genetic variant was of significance, which is N440K, which is found in a significantly large number, around 30% of genomes from Andhra Pradesh. But very recent data has also shown that this has now been emerging in many other states in Southern India, including Karnataka and, uh, and Telangana. The other variant of importance is E484K. And this is one of the genetic variants of immune escape, which is also shared by the South African lineage or the 501YV2. And this is now found in two genomes out of, uh, out of Maharashtra. Nothing to really be panicking about. But nevertheless, what you need to keep in track is that additional genetic mutations in this background of the genetic lineage could make it escape the immune system, or at least the humoral immune system. Now, the other question comes to Kerala to be pertinent. And this four charts essentially exemplifies what Kerala is and what Kerala is going to. Of course, on a daily basis, I see Facebook posts post from many of my colleagues and many of my friends uh, who are also clinicians and practicing in Kerala. For obvious reasons, they're all worried. Why is this epidemic not going away? For most of the country, it has gone away. Why? What's happening in Kerala? And that's also been echoed uh, by Dr. Kobragade. Now, this chart essentially explains what we are, right? And you should actually pat your back because as you see here from August 13th till today, your effective reproduction number is essentially one, right? That necessarily means that you have actually crushed the pandemic. You've stabilized the pandemic. Every individual is affecting only just one more individual, right? During the recovery period. Now that, that that's something really remarkable. And I mean, in my opinion, no other state anywhere else in the world, except for very advanced countries, like for example, Korea or Japan, uh, or, or for that matter, Germany and UK, has been able to crush the pandemic to such proportions quite effectively. You will see like a flat curve, except for the peaks during the, the, the end of the lockdowns, you don't really see any peak right from August 13th till the present date. If you look at the positivity rate, you'll also see the positivity rates have increased over time, that's expected, but now has actually started decreasing considerably in the, in the past three to four months. Now, what you need to keep in the context of this is the fourth chart out there. Uh, and third chart is of course the doubling time, which is essentially a factor of the reproductive number. But the fourth chart is even more remarkable. The fourth chart essentially states, what is your mobility, what is your uh, activity in terms of pre-lockdown 
versus the last one year of multiple different lockdowns that has happened. And what you see here is the charts have all almost normalized to the pre-pandemic era, right? Or I would say 20 to 30% difference of the pre-pandemic era. Or in other words, what, what it essentially means is that all human activities in Kerala has almost resumed to the pre-pandemic levels. But what you have done is exemplified in the first chart, which essentially means that Kerala has really crushed the pandemic and made it really, really flat and consistently flat over the last many months. Now, that really brings to the question, now, why should we do genomics and what should we do in genomics? Now, what we should really do in genomics is exemplified by what we discovered in UK very recently. UK was a country which crushed the pandemic, but then what you need to keep while crushing the pandemic is to also keep an open surveillance so that you can understand emerging outbreaks and understand genetic lineages which are emerging in the population and identify them very early in time so that you can contain them before it can actually spread into the community. In other words, you need to track the spread of this variance, not just variants which are locally prevalent, but also which are globally prevalent because no country in this world in a globalized era is isolated. So you need to keep a track of the entire world and also use the best of the tools that the world uses to be able to track these lineages. The second and more important thing that we need to do as the vaccines roll out is that over time, you will see breakthrough infections or reinfections of individuals who have otherwise taken vaccines because vaccines are not absolute and the effect of the vaccine is not permanent. In other words, these are also fertile soil for genetic variations to happen, which could now escape the immune activity and an active surveillance would identify them much earlier so that it doesn't really spread out into the community. <clears throat> Sorry. And of course, there are very specific clinical settings. And for that matter, one of it is immunosuppression, very, very widely used today in clinical settings because of transplantation and, of course, many other autoimmune conditions. And of course, other aspects of immunodeficiency, which are also active and fertile soil for the virus to persist in, in the host and, of course, mutate. And even more importantly, as we roll out vaccines, we also need to keep a close watch of immune escape mutations also in the context that immune escape mutations have been emerging, not just locally, but also globally in many other countries around us. I think I'll stop there and take questions, but before that, let me acknowledge a lot of people which made this possible. Uh, a lot of students in the lab um, who work from home or were actively engaged in activities in the lab, despite the lockdowns, fantastic collaborators, Sridhar for most of the next generation sequencing and assay development, and the bulwark behind all of genome epidemics. Fantastic set of collaborators from across the country of special mention would be uh, Professor Chandani, who is also my teacher. Uh, actually, all of them are my teachers. Uh, and apart from that, a fantastic set of collaborators from many other parts of the country, from UP, Rajasthan, uh, Tirnalveli, Karnataka, Orissa, and so on and so forth. And of course, this is all possible in, in terms of the analysis because this data is available in public domain. And thanks to a lot of researchers who put their data in public domain without worrying about credits. And of course, they all do to get the credits eventually. And of course, this is not possible without funding and all this funding for the early outbreak uh, investigations were funded by CSI through multiple different grants. So for interested individuals who would like to really follow up on the Kaila program, there's this website out there. Uh, I'm sure you would find it interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Vinu. Shall we uh, take up questions? Sure. Uh, Aravind, Aravind, the ZF infectious disease uh, in Medical College Trivandrum. 
uh, any relationship between the use of convalescent plasma and the genesis of immune escape mutants? Yeah, so there is no evidence uh, to suggest so, but except for desperate evidences which are now appearing in liter literature, uh, of really great significance is a very recent uh, preprint which has appeared. It's not really peer reviewed yet, but a recent preprint which actually used convalescent plasma uh, to culture viruses. And what they showed is that over a finite period of time, I believe around 70 odd days, the virus accumulated genetic mutations in the background of convalescent plasma to be exact three genetic mutations, which can now escape the, the humoral immune activity of the antibodies which are present in convalescent plasma. So now taking parallels from it, it is, it is understood that any pressure on the virus, whether it is therapeutic or whether it's immune, is going to allow the vi virus to escape uh, eventually by accumulating genetic mutations. So whatever pressure you apply, if you don't apply it quickly, the virus is going to evolve and virus is going to emerge out of it. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, next, uh, it's a, a congratulations from uh, Suma Madam. Suma Madam is uh, professor of medicine and a researcher from Government Medical College, Alapira. Regarding the reactivation, does it happen only under special situations like you have described, mm -hmm. the immunosuppression, or that anyone can have the reactivation? Could you please elaborate more on that? So, that is the query from whether it's yeah, whether it's reactivation or reinfection, these are uh, these are not a norm uh, in, in the sense that SARS-CoV-2 infection elicits a quite good immune response and which is, uh, which is available for a quite considerable amount of time, anything from uh, approximately six months to eight months going by the recent literature. Now, reinfections and reactivations are rare entities, but much rarer reported than they are because of the fact that to establish reinfection or reactivation, you need to have RNA samples for both the infections, which is not really easy to come by. Uh, now, having said that, we have not really seen either reinfections or reactivations in perfectly normal situations. Reinfections we do see, but what we also believe is that this could also be an underlying immune defect that we have still not identified, just because of the fact that these are rare entities. Now, there's no scientific proof of what are the host factors which contribute to it, but that's still an open question. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, Dr. Devraj is an assistant professor of community medicine from Medical College, Trivandra. How would they expect COVID shield to perform with even reinfection in picture, with even in reinfection in picture, how often we might require boosters? This is a very interesting question. So let us not name uh, or shame one or the other vaccines. Let's just consider the fact that they are vaccines. Vaccines are supposed to elicit an immune response, uh, both a humoral as well as T-cell response. Now, given any vaccine, given enough time for the uh, virus to mutate, the virus will mutate. And when the virus will mutate, that necessarily means that it can at some point of time by accumulating multiple mutations, escape any immune mechanisms. This could be immune mechanisms modulated by actual infections of SARS-CoV-2 or immune mechanisms modulated by proxy to infections, which are essentially vaccines. Now, that does, does that mean that the present vaccines are ineffective? No, the present vaccines are probably going to be effective for a considerable amount of time but nevertheless, when the virus mutates and new strains or the variants emerge, you need a new set of vaccines which can now handle this. So that necessarily means that this is not the first vaccine we are probably going to get. There are probably many more vaccines which are going to come by. Uh, Dr. Anish, Associate Professor of Community Medicine from Medical College Trivandra. We are speaking about immune escape and spread because of mutations. What about disease severity and mutations? Okay, now regarding disease severity, as far as the evidence goes, there is only one genetic mutation uh, in the ORF8 gene, uh, typically genetic deletions in the ORF8 gene, which causes less severe symptoms because of SARS-CoV-2 infections. 
Now, what if eight genetic mutations are not as rare as we think? They're quite, I'll not say predominant, but quite prevalent across different states. Even in the epidemic uh, surveillance that we sort of did, we did identify a set of uh, genomes with OR of eight deletions. And retrospective analysis have suggested that most of them had mild or no symptoms. So apart from that, I don't see any genetic variant uh, in terms of the evidence that can significantly increase the mortality or reduce the mortality. Thank you. Dr. Ajit Kumar K. Do you think there is a difference between different human races in response to virus or infectivity? Yeah, it, it, you, I mean, so you do observe difference in uh, what you call uh, the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2, the prevalence of severe SARS-CoV-2, the prevalence of deaths because of SARS-CoV-2, which are different in different, apparently different races across continents. And the problem with such a simplistic assessment is that we don't really factor into consideration a lot of other comorbidities or co-factors that could occur, co-occur with them. One of the most important of these factors are essentially age of the population, right? Many populations uh, in, in Asia and Africa are much younger than populations in, for example, uh, Europe or many of the advanced countries. Now, if you don't really factor in such major risk factors which are associated with the, the, the severe uh, SARS-CoV-2 or infections, uh, we are actually drawing a wrong picture. And I don't think anybody has really done this extensive study which has sort of adjusted for all of these. So at this point of time, uh, the answer is probably no evidence to suggest that. Dr. Ebi. Uh, as reactivation is occurring, does the virus become dormant in some area in our body? Yeah, so that is a hypothesis, but still a hypothesis because there is no way you can prove that because this is all in retrospect. The individual was positive, then he became negative for a considerable amount of period, around 42 days, and then got reactivated. So even in literature, there are only two cases of reactivation genomically confirmed. And that was, uh, is the first. Dr. Pranish again, is it possible to know the type of mutations and three-dimensional structure of protein, spike protein in case of SARS-CoV-2? Yes, uh, this is indeed an active area of research and practically every single genetic mutation has been mapped on the three-dimensional structure of SARS-CoV-2. And there are online resources which, uh, which provide this. Dr. Sajid Kumar, Head of Infectious Disease, Government Medical College, Kotem. Can we expect that different vaccines used in same population will lead to so many variant mutations in one country? No, variants are not related to vaccines at all. Uh, variant, the virus will generate variants even, even if there is no immune pressure or even if there is no vaccine. And that's what we have seen over the last one year. Vaccines are just very recent, probably a few months recent, but the virus has been accumulating an enormous amount of mutations even without all of this. So mutations would happen irrespective of whether you have a vaccine or not. Dr. Parvati from Microbiology Government Medical College, Alapura. Can we use the UP study among healthcare workers as a precursor for developing a guideline for surveillance of COVID infection among how who are on COVID duty? Would genetic sequencing of sort of events? Yeah, so uh, if you ask the question whether you should put all healthcare workers on surveillance, uh, the answer is probably yes, uh, because of two things. Uh, the first and important thing is that a significant number of individuals who are SARS-CoV-2 positive are asymptomatic. And asymptomatic healthcare workers are a dangerous thing because they could now infect individuals who are otherwise uh, uh, coming for uh, or seeking health care for a non-COVID reason. The second thing is that they could transmit it among your co their own colleagues and then therefore create an outbreak or an epidemic in a hospital, which is absolutely something that you should prevent. So my opinion is that 
in any healthcare system, you need to have some sort of surveillance. I will not say you need to do real time PCR, but some sort of surveillance, even rapid antigen testing at a regular interval should be good enough. Uh, Sajid sir, again, uh, is indiscriminate use of remdesivir were also contributing? Yeah, we don't really know because until you do a controlled study to do that, to take uh, genomes for uh, individuals who got remdesivir versus who didn't, uh, also map the period in time when remdesivir was given in a particular hospital settings, uh, this is not possible to answer. But of course, uh, the, the, the quick answer of that is yes, if you ask open questions and if you keep pursuing them you will find the answers indu you are muted thank you ma'am uh so madam again uh, it's known that UK variant is rapidly spreading and disease is more serious. With the genetic sequencing, what are the modifications, new strategies and management that could be thought of? Yeah, a small addendum, UK strain is supposed to be more infectious, but it is not supposed to be more serious. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a different aspect of it. So I'll explain it this way. Uh, if a, a virus infects more people and a proportion of those people uh, would become severe, right? A more infectious virus would affect a far larger number of people and therefore the proportions of severe people would increase. It's not because of the virus, but just because of the fact that it suddenly can infect a larger proportion of people. Now, how does genomics help? Of course, genomics can help because what we don't want to happen is 501YV1, which is a UK variant, to go into the community because if it goes into the community, you will exactly see what D614G has done uh, in India. What D614G has done is to actually replace all the other lineages of the virus and become the dominant virus. Today, I would say around 99% of all viruses have D614G. Now, tomorrow, what you don't want to have is to have a very infectious virus, which becomes very dominant in the population. That, that really becomes a problem. So to prevent that, what you need to do is to do surveillance so that none of the 501V1 gets into the general population. And if it gets into the general population, then it becomes very difficult to contain it. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, Dr. Rajendra, he's the professor at the Central University, Kasaragod, actually Central. Dr. Indu, Indian selection I pressure, which might have caused the genetic variations of SARS-CoV-2, like drugs, plasma therapy, temperature, etc. Yes, so <laughs> practically any treatment that you give, any vaccine that you give, any convalescent plasma that you give, yeah. any monoclonal antibody that you give is going to create a pressure on the, on the virus and the virus is going to escape it by accumulating mutations over time. So this is, this is in fact uh, applicable to every single aspect of selection pressure, uh, which is applied across the virus. So what you need to keep in mind is that a fast approach to killing a pathogen is what you need to keep in mind. This is not just for viruses, but applicable across a variety of other pathogens, including larger organisms, like for example, tuberculosis. So drug resistance happens when you give something for a very long period of time and for an insufficient quantity, typically, so that the virus can now try to escape uh, the mechanisms. Dr. Abby, what is the rate at which immune escape mutations are occurring? Will this vaccine drive be able to overpower it? Yeah, so... Uh, the immune escape mutations, if you look at the timelines, how they have developed, uh, they have developed more recently, which uh, means that there have been some sort of an immune pressure, which actually caused this virus, virus variants to emerge. Now, does vaccine solve it? Uh, the answer is yes and no. So if you do a large vaccination drive, which is quick enough to cover a large proportion of the population, 
then yes, you can minimize such variants from emerging out. But for example, if you do vaccine drives where individual got say half the dose or inadequate dose or the individual was immunized improperly, then you would have this virus emerge. And when once they emerge, then that necessarily means that even the vaccinated population is going to be susceptible because now they can evade that response altogether. So that is what you need to keep in mind as a, in the public health perspective, that whatever strategy that you use has to be really effective, really quick, and really driven in terms of the evidence. Dr. Aravind? Do you think that virus from all immunocompromised patients with SARS-CoV-2 should be sequenced? As prolonged persistence of virus in them may result in development of variants. Okay, the answer is probably no. Uh, what, uh, what you need to keep in consideration as a public health perspective is that these individuals who are immunocompromised are likely to have a persistent or prolonged infection. And then therefore the containment measures for these individuals should be put in place, which is some probably much more effective methodology than just sequencing the virus, because sequencing the virus is not going to solve the problem. The solution to the problem is that if there is a persistent infection and the virus accumulates mutations, there is evidence to suggest so. Uh, there are a couple of uh, papers in the recent years where, recent months where they've shown that in an immun immunocompromised host, the virus can mute, accumulate additional mutations. What you need to prevent is this mutations from escaping out into the population or escaping out into the community. So I think a much more effective way is to provide an extended quarantine and testing uh, mandate rather than just sequencing the virus. The sequencing of the virus will only allow you to identify that there's a mutation, right? It is not going to contain the mutation. Uh, next, uh, your batchmate, Dr. Shiva Prasad, who is the District Nodal Officer of Antimicrobial Resistance Program at Nakulam, congratulates you. Uh, and uh, he has a query. Your presentation highlights the importance of NGS, whole genomic sequence in viral and bacterial infections. Leapfrogging of laboratories needed. Your comment on this. Yeah, so uh, absolutely right. And thank you, uh, Shiva, for pointing this out. Uh, a year ago, right, if I would have come to Kerala and said you need to do genome sequence of even a virus, pathogen, whatever, I mean, uh, uh, people would laugh at you, right? Uh, people would laugh at you because genome sequencing is something that happens probably only in UK, only in US, and probably only in Delhi, right? Uh, not anymore. Uh, genome sequencing has now become quite pervasive. And as a matter of fact, I would say there are at least four, if not five genome sequencing machines right there in Kerala. And I think uh, I think that's a good time to put that to use, not just for this epidemic, but also for future epidemics, not just for epidemics, but also understanding a much more serious concern, which is antimicrobial resistance. So antimicrobial resistance is something that Kerala should really be concerned about as there are a large number of antibiotics which are widely used in the population, many of them which are even available off the counter, uh, necessarily means that there is going to be a significant number of resistance that's going to emerge. And the only solution to that is to do surveillance. And surveillance necessarily means that you need to do part or whole of the genome. Suma, madam, any continuation of her previous question, apart from surveillance, does the sequencing help in deciding the use of new monoclonal antibodies? In specific situations, probably yes. Uh, specific situations in, for example, a patient who is serious, uh, has not been responding to therapy and you're planning to give a particular monoclonal antibody or a particular combinations of monoclonal antibodies, then probably yes, but except for those very specific situations, I don't, I don't think. Thank you. I think those are the questions from the chat box. Uh, any, any other queries? 
comments, interaction. We know you covered uh, for this whole Sir. intricacies and nuances of genome in a very minutest uh, details, uh, like genome itself. Uh, the, in fact, I would urge uh, you also, you know, give your uh, some, I think, uh, analysis regarding the epidemic in the state. We had some interaction, and it will be good uh, put for thought for all the pits in. Uh, at least in the respective district, uh, they will get into the uh, details uh, based on <clears throat> both the studies and also your this overview. So uh, can you just, uh, you know, uh, now uh, uh, explain or, you know, based on the uh, genome study in the country and also other parts of the world uh, yeah. by uh, doing the comparative analysis of a pilot and then overall data reading of the epidemic in the state of Kerala. Right. So in terms of the numbers uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive patients who have been sequenced, very different countries have very different kind of numbers. Uh, but the, the really top countries who have been extensively using genome sequencing to track and contain epidemics have been Australia, which sequences almost 50% of all cases of SARS-CoV-2. New Zealand, which also almost sequence that number. And then comes countries like, for example, UK, which sequences around 10 to 15% of the, of the samples, uh, at least in the past, but not very recently. And then comes places like India, we are, we are sequencing probably 0.05% of all the samples uh, out there. Now, there are different aspects to this. For example, Australia has been able to track every single individual who has been coming into the country who has SARS-CoV-2 positive, has been able to track every single epidemic so that you can, you can selectively shut down specific operations to be able to do that kind of an epidemiology. Now, of course, that requires a lot of more investment in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of implementing it, and not really the cost because the cost is typically quite comparable to what you do in real-time PCRs, probably the double the cost of a real-time PCR. But you need to have that kind of a, what you call infrastructure and a system built. Now, the second aspect of it is, in terms of the genomes that have been uh, sequenced and analyzed, how, how do we fare? And, and probably after this program uh, uh, gets completed, probably in the first month of the program with around 1500 genomes, Kerala probably would be in terms of the density quite comparable to many of these developed countries. Uh, at least I would say would be comparable to at least UK in, in, in percentages of samples sequenced uh, and analyzed. Now, how do we use it? What we need to build in the system is widespread education and awareness, not just among clinicians, but also the general public because the implementation of a particular policy or an information so when you say there is a 501v1 variant, uh, we should not really call it a UK variant because, I mean, just because UK uh, identified it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. But if you say 501v1, right, it's highly infectious, you identified it. Now, what really impacted the entire world is how it was communicated across the world, right? Now, today, everybody knows about UK variant. Everybody knows that it is infectious. People are more open to getting sequenced, right? And people are implementing policies for sequencing travelers across the world. And this has really impacted not just the system, but also the common man in terms of awareness, in terms of taking more protective uh, action, in terms of reporting when traveling, et cetera, et cetera, right? And eventually going forward, genomics can give you evidence, but implementing the evidence, you need to have the common man on your side. And that really requires a very well orchestrated, what I call communication system, making aware of people what we should do and what we should not do, or what take what is a take that you have on, on such an aspect. Now, this is really more important because as we roll out vaccines, now the, the vaccines are rolled out for healthcare workers, but as we now roll out to the general public, this communication 
in terms of new variants emerging, immune escape happening, we need to actually keep the channels much more open uh, so that it doesn't really just remain in the academic circles or the clinician circles that there are variants emerging. But the public should also be aware that there are variants emerging so that they can take proactive steps. And the first chart right here essentially sort of exemplifies because um, my parents still are in Kerala. So uh, practically everybody sticks or adheres to the, the, the practice of distancing, practice of wearing masks, practice of hygiene. And this has been implemented over months by consistent effort of healthcare workers, consistent effort of the media, consistent communication, right? That has happened in terms of break the chain. Now, this is something that we need to extend going further. In terms of the genomes, now India is also rolling out a program to sequence 5% of all positives. Uh, this is a new program that has been initiated by the Ministry of Health uh, in association with DBT and many other organi uh, organizations, including CSIR. Uh, and this program is called INSACOG. Uh, and the idea is to sequence 5% of all positive isolates from across the country so that whenever there is an outbreak, whether, whenever there is a breakthrough uh, reinfection or an infection after vaccination, we should be able to identify such strains much, much earlier. Now, what I would say is Kerala is probably a few months ahead of the game because we already have a system in place. We have institutions lined up. We have pilot studies in place. We have already sequenced, started sequencing isolates from across the state. Now, what we should now breach is how do we now implement this in public policy so that that becomes an example that everybody else can actually follow. Uh, to be frank, in fact, the Kerala model is what is largely being followed in Insacoc, uh, where there is active surveillance, which is part of uh, the surveillance system led by NCDC. Uh, Dr. Meenakshi is very well aware about it. Uh, and how to really roll it out against, uh, across different states is something that we should really become a model because we have much more experience. Yeah, thank you. Very actually, much. yeah, there was uh, there are a few questions from the Facebook, sir, because there was no space in the Zoom room. The, it was uh, uh, live Facebook, and there is, it may take up one or two questions from the Facebook also, sir. Queries, if there is sure, time. Sure, sir. sure, man. Uh, how much? It's from Dr. Shyam Kumar Devagaran. How much can we translate the lab results in vivo? Since the vaccine-induced immunity is polyclonal and also T-cell mediated, experts think it's possible to improve herd immunity with the current vaccines. Yeah, so there's no doubt that vaccines will improve herd immunity and that's really the purpose of doing vaccination. And at least the early uh, results from places like Israel, which has done massive scale immunization, is really a reckoner to this fact that vaccines implemented at scale, implemented effectively can actually bring uh, the infection down really considerably. Now, really a good point that you raised and which I also stated that immunity in against a, a virus is uh, dual pronged, one with the humoral immunity, the second one with the T cell immunity. Now, largely what assays have shown is about the humoral immunity. There is very less evidence about uh, T cell immunity. But having said that, if you go by parallel examples of, for example, hepatitis B, where they are now immune escape mutations, hepatitis B is another virus, which has an RNA intermediate while replication, has pretty much similar rate of replication as, for example, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there are immune escape mutations even for hepatitis B. So that necessarily means that we don't really understand the immune system as well. And of course, as we sequence more and as we sequence breakthrough infections, and that's what I sort of mentioned quite in the last slide, that breakthrough infections after vaccines is something that we need to ensure that all of them get sequenced because that is really a reckoner to what is emerging. It may not be antibody escape, but it could also be T-cell escape because T-cell escape is something much easier to, uh, to emerge because of the very well fact that single mutations can disrupt the the presentations on their MHC uh, to the T cells. Uh, and then therefore, uh, that's something that is very easy to develop. 
do you think uh, that some of the people who are negative in RT-PCR as due to mutations occurred in the probes binding region? If yes, should we also look into RT-PCR negative people to check for mutations along with the RT-PCR positive people? That's from Dr. Prajit. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Uh, uh, so uh, RT-PCRs are not 100% sensitive uh, compared to sequencing, uh, what, whatever early analysis have suggested is that uh, the COVID sec or the Megalab approach that I sort of mentioned can pick up at least around 10% more positives compared to RTPCR. Now, uh, you need to keep in mind that just picking up a positive is not something that is clinically relevant because what is clinically relevant is whether the virus is infectious or not, right? That answer we don't really have. Uh, the second question is whether, so the aspect of it is whether the False negatives could be because of RT-PCR uh, primer probe binding, primer probe binding site mutations. The answer is yes. Uh, we have documented it and reported it, and there, now there are enough literature available uh, on individual primers and probes and genetic variations which can disrupt them. Um, so, if the individual is symptomatic, uh, classical symptoms of COVID uh, investigations suggest COVID, RT-PCR negative. Probably the two options that you could you could do one is to also alternatively test on rapid antigen testing because that uses an alternate methodology altogether, which is devoid of primers and probes. And the second approach, of course, is to probably sequence them uh, because it's not very expensive to sequence them. Uh, Rajan sir, Ramla madam. Uh... Everyone else, I think there are many uh, senior professors, sec dignitaries uh, in, in the Zoom and uh, watching uh, from NHM Facebook page as well. Uh, are there further queries? Ramla, madam? Yeah, I, I must congratulate Dr. Vinod for his excellent presentations and highlights. There are so many dark points that we have, we have been highlighted in this talk. And I think we will go forward with this kind of sessions in future. And we will invite you later also, Vinod, for your evaluations and your uh, advices in the management of COVID. Okay, Vinod, congratulations. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. For your team also. Thank you. Okay. Shall we close, Indu? Because I think we I think uh, it's two hours now. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. I think Rajesh uh, has left. Yes. Uh, no, no, I am online, but you complete. That is your only thing. Yeah, good. Uh, the Dr. Vinod, in fact, the, the next time in depth, uh, what I want is. Uh, because there is a lot of loose talk going around. I had uh, di discussed that, you know, the uh, what in fact, uh, even, uh, you know, media also takes a very uh, extreme position without knowing the nuances. So it will be very good, uh, you know, some uh, technical insight, a technical paper or note based on whatever uh, data we are having regarding the genome and also other data set, if uh, if it is uh, put across, uh, you know, uh, appropriately, contextually, uh, not mentioning, in fact, uh, only focusing at Kerala, but uh, totally, you know, uh, doing a comparison uh, countrywide, uh, it will be it will be a good, very scientific initiative. So uh, keep that in mind. In fact, how we can structure it that uh, we can discuss further. Yeah. Uh, but uh, really, I think it was a very meaningful interaction and uh, very useful for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinod. I think uh, Dr. Shija Suguna, she's our intensivist from pediatric side. She's also a vaccinologist kind. She has written a book on vaccines. RNA, DNA vaccines are looking at spike protein genome. Will an effective whole virion kill vaccine be better option in mutation? Yeah, so there are two aspects to this. Um, the one aspect is that a spike protein by itself is likely to elicit only humoral response and very less T cell response because there is nothing that gets into the T cell because it's just a protein out there. Whole virus is either inactivated or live attenuated. 
right, are effective in developing T cell response because the cells can take it and then present it on the MHC to T cells for them to recognize, which can elicit now a T cell response additionally. Now, killed vaccines typically elicit a much lesser T cell response uh, just because of the fact that they cannot really uh, grow in numbers and then therefore infect more cells to elicit more T cell response. But live attenuated viruses, right, can elicit actually both responses, both humoral as well as very good T cell responses. We still do not have a live attenuated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, so we don't really know. And uh, and and then therefore, uh, I mean, yes, the the present whole virion vaccines would elicit an additional T cell response, but how effective is the T cell response is something that we don't really need. There are multiple questions from the Facebook in relation to antibody dependent enhancement and COVID vaccines. Yeah, so this is something that we don't have any evidence yet. Um, antibody dependent enhancement is something that we need to watch out for sure. Uh, uh, and a similar thing that we need to watch out is also autoimmune mechanisms. Uh, so until we have like a real large data set of individuals who have developed any one of these outcomes, we, we are not in a position to essentially say what is good. I mean, what we all have is essentially, at least in India, a phase two clinical trial data uh, for one of these vaccines, which is very limited to be able to make such assessments altogether. So I think we should really wait for the data to come. Okay, that is Dr. Prabhida Mohan. Uh, I think, Aravind, did you say anything Aravind? Okay. Shall we wind up? Thomas Matthew, sir, I think. Meenakshi, Rathan, sir, any final uh, comment policies? It was really a pleasure to see some of your graphs and your epidemiology interpretations and public health implications, you know, because uh, over the past few days, the positivity rate, the number of cases going up, and there are discussions as to, you know, Kerala still has numbers. What is happening elsewhere, right? So those kinds of comparisons. And your yeah, uh, evidence and science and connecting it with from the lab to the field, from the graphs to the, I mean, the genome to the graph or uh, either way, right? So getting this holistic picture and get, you know, trying to solve answers. Of course, with vaccines around, you know, we are linking it to that. So from the lab to the vaccine, to the field, epidemiology, like everything. So it is, it's, it's, a real, uh, it's a real pleasure to see these graphs, uh, uh, Venut. And, yeah, thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and in I'm, fact, I, I made this graph to share with a few of my own classmates and colleagues uh, who have always been naysayers saying that Kerala is doing bad. Uh, so I always collect these graphs. Uh, I mean, this data is publicly available. Anybody can actually verify this data. Uh, it's not that I collected this data. It is official data co collected from public resources. And uh, I mean, I, I just ask them, can anybody else show me another state which has a flat curve spanning a few months? The answer is probably no. So uh, in the group, we have... Uh... Uh, experts, clinicians, critical care specialists, uh, lab experts, microbiologists, uh, all infectious disease pediatrics. So it is a it's a real uh, uh, mix of uh, the, the the everyone who faced the pandemic uh, from the field. We have the district medical officers, district surveillance officers, uh, the uh, everyone. So this this this. Uh, kind of interaction, uh, it's, it's, it's really great to have uh, Dr. Vinod amongst us. Uh, as I was just mentioning, uh, I, I am not sure whether um, our university vice chancellor is still in the group. So it's, it's a real uh, Mohan Sarondo. Chandni Madam Mohan Sarondo, I don't know. You should have invited him also for a remark. So he was, I could see him, Dr. Rajmohan, very senior professors were all there. Um, and uh, to thank um, 
uh, I must thank and acknowledge uh, our Principal Secretary Rajan Kubragadesa for his leadership, for taking the initiative for the study, for um, actually he was pressurizing all of us uh, to, you know, uh, to have uh, a fast forward and come out with results so that policies can be made, not only this, this is prevalence and other related, uh, you know, generating evidence so that policies can be evidence-based. Thank you, sir, for your leadership, encouragement, and for participating all throughout and for your valuable inputs. I also thank Dr. Ekten Kilkar, the State Mission Director of NHM, uh, for all his support guidance and uh, Director of Medical Education, uh, Ramla Madam. Madam is actually the host of the program. Uh, thank you, Ramla Madam. Thank you, uh, Sarita Madam. Thank you, Dr. Meenakshi. Thank you, uh, Sarah Madam. Uh, Thomas Matthew, sir, Harris, sir. Uh, I think very senior professors in the group. Uh, Suma Madam, Chandani Madam. Uh, I think many uh, hospital superintendents, principals, and very senior faculty uh, from um, private medical colleges because of lack of time, I'm not able to mention the names, very senior professors from, and also from a uh, private uh, sector, the, the uh, Indian Medical Association. Uh, and uh, I understand that uh, once the Zoom room was full, uh, the, the Facebook, uh, that the live from the NHM page was also very active. Uh, we are really humbled by the kind of response uh, thank you very much. I think together we will move forward and let's, it's a learning experience for all of us. So let's uh, move forward together. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, we will meet again with a topic related to uh, COVID and communicable diseases only. Some of the suggestions that came up in the state pizza group was related to vaccination. So we'll continue uh, the discussion there and come out with the topic for the next update. Uh, we also thought of um, ex experience sharing from our own uh, faculty and resource persons and from the field in the upcoming updates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you and good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Vinod and uh, Dr. Indu. I am in another place. I am attending one function. That's why I couldn't speak. Thank you, Meena. Thank you. <laughs>